Hey everybody, it's Tuesday, October 6th. As you can see here in the AIM today, today's video is going to be all about experimental design. So, on yesterday's video, we spent a decent amount of time at the end discussing experimental design and some basic tips associated with experimental design. So I want to go through those tips here, and then basically I'm just going to give you an example of an experimental design question that I want you to work on for a little while. So the first thing to say here is, as far as experimental design tips are concerned, you're basically going to approach all of these problems the same way. You're going to identify what they're asking you to solve for. So you're going to look at the problem and you're going to say, they're asking me to design an experiment to determine what. Then you're going to figure out what you can measure with the equipment that is provided. Then you're going to look at other physical quantities that are established in the problem or see what assumptions you can make. And then you're going to figure out what equation relates the unknown, the quantities that you're going to measure, and the things that you are implying or you're assuming to be a certain value. And so here it says, note, the equation will allow you to solve for the unknown, which is the point of the investigation. So essentially here, there are a lot of ways that you can do this, but the main focus of thinking about the way you could design any experiment should be the equation. That should be your main focus. And so I want to give you an example that you don't know a whole lot about so that I don't give away the answer to this problem, but hopefully you'll be able to take some lessons from that for this problem. You might remember a little bit, in honors physics, we talked about springs. And when we talked about springs, we said there's an equation that relates the spring force to the amount that the spring is stretched. And the equation looked like this. Whether you remember it or not, it's not important. That equation has the letter K in it, and the K stands for the spring constant. And so you can use that equation to solve for the spring constant, which gives you this equation. In this course, later in probably March, we're going to be talking about another equation for the period of oscillation of a spring when that spring is oscillating, meaning it's bouncing back and forth between two extremes. And that equation looks like this. And so if you were to solve that for K, you would get, so it would look like this. And both of these equations can be used to solve for K. Obviously, though, depending on which equation you use, you're going to end up doing a very different experiment. Because the equation dictates what needs to be measured and what needs to be measured determines what equipment you're going to use. That's actually a very important point, so let's go ahead and write that down before we get back to this here in a second. Let's say the equation you choose to use, this would be a note, by the way, the equation you choose to use determines which variables you measure and the variables you measure determine which equipment needs to be used. I'll put this back on the screen here in a second. But that's the main point. The equation you choose to use determines which variable you measure and the variables you measure determine which equipment needs to be used. So in our lab, which I hope you get the chance to see, 
we have devices called force meters. And so you can measure the force using a force meter, and X is the amount the spring stretches. And so clearly you can measure that with a meter stick, how much the spring stretches. 4 and pi over here for this equation are constants, but the mass attached at the end of the spring can be measured in a variety of ways, like a triple beam balance or a digital scale. And the period of oscillation here, this uh, uppercase T, is a period measurement, which is a, a measurement of time, really. And so that could be measured in any number of ways, most obvious, using a stopwatch. So that's the idea. You figure out what they're asking you to measure. Oh, they're asking me the spring constant. What are all the equations I know for the spring constant? Okay, what am I allowed to measure based on the equipment I'm given? And then figure out which one works the best. So notice, I want to go back to the list we had a second ago. Notice it says here, Determine which physical quantities can be measured with the equipment that's provided, number two. Let's pretend in this problem, they said you have access to a force meter, a meter stick, and a stopwatch. That would mean you can't do this one because you don't have a triple beam balance to measure the mass of the object. Or... You could imagine, what if they said you have a triple mean balance, a stopwatch, and a force meter? Then you don't have a meter stick to measure the stretch, so then this method would be out. That's the idea. You think about what they're asking you for. You think about all the equations that you know that you could solve for that variable. And then you think about, based on the equipment given, what are the actual things I can measure and hopefully that will allow you to to choose which equation will you know will yield the simplest experiment let me go ahead and put that back on the screen in case you didn't get a chance to write that down if you didn't get a chance to write that down pause this video here write that down and when you hit play we'll jump to the problem okay so as i mentioned Getting this down is going to take time. But it's something that we need to practice because they are going to ask you to design an experiment on the AP test. So before we do that, and we are going to go to the sheet in a second, but I just want to say one more thing. In describing how to design an experiment, you want to make sure your procedure includes the following. First would be the, ex the variable you are trying to find. Two, your overall experimental setup. Three, the equipment used to measure each variable along with exactly how that equipment is going to be used. Four steps to minimize experimental uncertainty. And the last thing we want to say here is since the data analysis part is separate, you only need to talk about collecting data. No analysis or math. Now, the reason why I say since the data anal analysis part of the experiment is separate is because on the AP test, after you answer the part about the procedure, the very next, sec next section says, how would you analyze the data you talked about collecting in the procedure to determine the answer? And that's when you talk about that. So you definitely want to make sure you're saying we're doing this experiment to measure blank. 
we're going to set this thing up like this. We're going to use this piece of equipment to measure this variable. We're going to use this piece of equipment to measure this variable. And this is how we're going to make sure we get the best data possible and limit our experimental uncertainty. And we are going to use this basic approach, this framework here, to describe it an experiment, at least for right now, where we measure the acceleration of an object. So if you go to your Google Classroom page and you go to the post where you found this video, you will see a worksheet entitled Designing Acceleration Experiments. And I'd like you to work on number one. Number one says a physics class is tasked with designing an experiment to determine the acceleration of a student on inline skates coasting straight down an incline. The incline has a constant slope. Now, I'm just going to tell you because we haven't gotten up to this yet. What you will see in like a month when we get to talk about forces and the forces acting on an object moving on an inclined plane, that the fact that the slope is constant means that the angle of the ramp is constant. And all that really means is that the acceleration is constant. So this person, as they go down this ramp, has a constant acceleration. And it says here the students have tape measures, traffic cones, and stopwatches. And part one here, and I gave plenty of lines, so you don't need to go nuts about filling all of them necessarily. Uh, the first part of this is to describe a procedure to obtain the measurements necessary for this experiment. So what I'd like you to do here is use the tips that I just gave you here at the beginning to think about ways that you could determine the acceleration of this roller skater and then describe the procedure by writing it down on these lines, making sure you address these points here. Now, this takes time. I only want you to focus on one. Don't worry about two yet. You can actually write down the answer to two, though, to help you answer one if you want. But I'd like you to focus on number one, pausing this video here for maybe 10 minutes until you have a good answer. And when you're done, you can hit play, and we'll go over it. The point of this problem was to ask you to design an experiment to measure acceleration. What's easy about designing an experiment to measure acceleration is that there's a lot of equations that you can use to measure acceleration. What's difficult about designing an experiment to measure acceleration is that there's so many equations you can use. And unfortunately, what that means is that some methods are just going to be better than others. So because I've been doing this for a long time, I have heard, I would imagine, almost all of the sample answers that one could give. And so I want to go through those with you now so we could evaluate all of them and talk about which one is best. So generally, the first person who raises their hand and offers up an explanation says, listen, I'm not trying to mess with anything here. Let's just go with the most straightforward approach, which is just to use the acceleration equation. And I say, okay, sure. According to that equation, what do you have to measure then? And according to that equation, the definition of acceleration, if you wanted to measure acceleration, you would need to measure the final velocity, the initial velocity, and the time. And that begs a very important question. If you were doing an experiment using this equation, how could you make your life easier? And you can make your life easier by making an assumption 
that the rollerblader is always going to start from rest. And if that were the case, then you would just need to measure the final velocity and the time. And doing that is not particularly hard. Generally, I say like, okay, now what's the setup? And the kid says, well, I've got my ramp. I've got my ramp here, and I'm going to have the rollerblader start at the top of the ramp. And they're going to skate between a cone at the top and a cone at the bottom. And I'm going to use the tape measure to measure the length of this distance here so that that's known. And I say, okay. And then they say, I'm going to have the rollerblader start from here at the top, and the initial speed is going to be zero. And the rollerblader is going to come down. But of course, we have a challenge here, which is to measure the final velocity. So if, let's say, this distance here is 50 meters, over the last, oh, let's call it five meters, we're going to put another cone so that we have two cones. And if we know the distance, and if we have people, some of the students here standing with stopwatches, we can measure the time, and that's how we can determine the speed, and that speed will be the final speed. And the time here is not going to be that time, the time it takes just to go to be between these two cones, because that's the total time that it took them to accelerate from the initial speed of zero to that speed. And so we're going to have a bunch of kids in the class with a bunch of stopwatches measuring the time it takes to go from start to finish. And if I have that time, and I use V equals D over T here to find the final velocity, that will give me the acceleration. I would imagine some of you thought of something that looks pretty similar to that. And that's okay. That'll probably give you a pretty good answer for the acceleration. There are issues with it, though. So how else could we do this? And somebody else raises their hand. And they say, well, I didn't want to use that equation. I wanted to use good old time-independent equation. Because measuring time with stopwatches is hard, because everybody has a reaction time, I figured I could use this equation. And if I take this equation and I solve it for the acceleration, then I get this. And of course, if I also assume that they're starting from rest, then when I solve it, you get an equation that looks like that. And of course, the question I always ask here, which person usually acknowledges, is you realize you have to use a stopwatch here at some point also, right? Because you got to measure time if you're going to measure that final velocity. But of course, this one works out pretty simply. We're going to assume that our initial speed is zero. Our delta x is going to be measured with a tape measure and cones. And our v final is basically going to be measured by using v equals d over t. And so the setup here would be real similar. We have a cone at the top. We have a cone at the bottom. And that distance is going to be known. Let's call it 50 meters. That's our delta x right there. And then to measure the final velocity, we could set up another cone down here, have the rollerblader start, and go down like this, and they get their v-final at the end, which can be measured by finding out how long it takes the rollerblader to go past these two cones, which are a set distance apart. And so we take that set distance apart, we take the time that it takes to travel that set distance, and that's our speed, 
which we are calling for the purposes of our experiment, our V final. And then you just go ahead and you take A equals V final, you square it, and you divide it by twice that total displacement. And that's how you get your acceleration. And that, just like the last method, is pretty good. It'll probably get you a pretty good answer. But it also has some problems. And now that we've discussed this experiment here, we could actually go through the problems with both parts. Even if you didn't do these, or even if you did, now that you've heard me to describe it in both ways, what is the problem with this setup? Even if you did it, I'm not asking you to fix your, your work, but this is a good thing to think about. What is the problem with this setup? Take a second to pause this video here. And when you hit play, we'll talk about it. Think about the problems. What is the problem with this setup? All right, go ahead and hit pause. Okay, so hopefully you've zeroed in on the problem here. The problem with both of these methods lies with this part here, using V equals D over T to measure that final velocity. Because a very important point, oh my God, to remember here is that V equals D over T is not final velocity or initial velocity. It is the average velocity. And because this object is accelerating the whole way down, by the time it reaches the bottom, not only in between these two posts does it have a, a non-zero initial velocity here, but it also continues to accelerate as it continues down. And so the problem with this is that if you are measuring the time or the distance, regardless of whichever equation you use, you need one of those, the time for the A equals VF minus V naught over T and the distance for the time independent equation, you're measuring that from start to finish. And if you're using V equals D over T, what you're measuring is the average velocity, which is in between these two velocities. Remember, for an accelerating object, the average velocity is the sum of the initial and final velocities divided by two. So if the initial velocity, when it reaches the first cone here at the bottom, is 10 meters per second, and the final velocity is 20 meters per second, then what you're actually calculating by using V equals D over T is 15 meters per second. And by saying that's the final velocity, what you are saying is that the velocity by the time it reaches the very end is 15 when it's actually 20. Now, the numbers are not going to be that drastically different because the fact that it has accelerated for so long means it's going to move through this distance in a really short amount of time. And because it moves through that distance in a really short amount of time, it's not going to accelerate that much. The speed isn't going to change that much. But if, let's say, the, the speed goes from 15 at the first cone to 16 in the middle to 17 at the last cone, you would still be using the average speed of 16 when the final speed is actually 17. Is it going to make that much of a difference? No, not really. A difference of 1 out of 16 is, is not that much. But it's like 6% off. And so 6% is a, is, a, is a pretty decent amount. There's a way to correct for this, though. And the way to correct for this is by thinking about another equation that has acceleration. And another equation that has acceleration is the displacement equation.
delta x equals v naught t plus one half a t squared. Because if we make the assumption that the initial velocity is zero, then all we have to do to measure our acceleration according to this equation is measure delta x and t. And that's it. Now, I'm sure I know what some of you might be thinking. Some of you might be thinking all of those problems that you described about measuring the velocity could easily be solved by using a motion sensor or a photo gate. First of all, not only did they say you were not allowed to use those for this problem, it's also important to realize motion sensors are small and they are only designed to work over laboratory distances. I think the farthest it can measure is like nine meters. And the photo gate is small. That device that's shown here in the back, back here, that's like the size of a cell phone. These things are tiny. You can't have a person on rollerblades skate through a photo gate. Now, some people say, well, can't you have the person hold this thing in their hand and slice it through the photo gate like it's slicing through the photo gate here when they skate by? That would only work if it was perfectly level. And it would be almost impossible to do that. The reason why I bring this up is because one year there was an experimental design question that was basically a conservation of momentum problem talking about a ball bouncing off of a wall. And a lot of kids in my class and in other classes said they were going to throw the ball at a wall and have the ball pass through a photo gate. I'll just do this here because there's space. So they said they'll throw the ball at the wall and they'll have the ball pass through the photo gate. Doing that would be almost impossible. And they did not give the kids any credit for that. Because in order to get credits on an experimental design question, it has to be reasonable. And that's not reasonable. To assume that you can throw a tennis ball from across a room and get the exact center of the tennis ball to pass through the exact center of the beam so that the diameter of the tennis ball that you put into the computer is exactly the distance passing through the photo gate when it's measuring the time is utterly ridiculous. It's never going to happen. And so whenever you're doing these experiments, you want to make sure that you are describing experiments that are reasonable and can feasibly be done. And so this equation is nice because it can be. Delta x here is going to be the total distance that's traveled as the person accelerates from rest. And the time here is just going to be the total time. And so there are a number of ways that you can do it, but here's probably the most thorough way. I'm actually going to draw this on another slide. Let's say this ramp was sufficiently long so that you can say, I'm going to have the rollerblader go like 40 meters if this is zero. And so I'm going to take cones and I'm going to put them every five meters. So it's five meters, 10. 15, 20, 25, and so on. And I'm going to have the rollerblader start from right here. I already know that this is 5 meters because I've measured them out. So now all I need to use are the cones. So I know that the first cone is the 5-meter cone. And I'm going to say 3, 2, 1, 
go. And I'm going to have somebody down here with a stopwatch measure the time it takes. And there's my time. I know the distance five meters. I now just measured the time. And so I could plug it into that equation and boom, we got the acceleration. Now, I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, wait a second, if you just said, boom, we have the acceleration, then why did you space out all these cones all this way? And the point here is pretty simple. Any explanation that you give for an experimental design has to include steps to minimize experimental uncertainty. It has to. And this is how you minimize experimental uncertainty. You minimize experimental uncertainty by doing trials. And since the problem on the sheet said you have a whole physics class at your disposal, you can actually do some of these trials at the same time. What I would do is I would say three kids are going to stand at the five meter cone, three kids at the 10, three kids at the 15, three kids at the 20, three kids at the 25, and so on. And I'm going to say when the rollerblader starts here, what three, two, one, go, that there are three kids for the first trial measuring time 1A, kid A, time on trial 1, kid B, and the time on trial 1, kid C. And then the kid's going to get to the bottom. They're going to stop with their stopwatches. And now notice we have three times. Then for trial two, we would get T2A, T2B, and T2C. Those three kids measure the times again. And if we just did that three times, three trials for the kid to go from five down to the bottom, now we would have nine times at five meters. And you can average them all together to find your time uh, you, to find the time that you are calling your five meter time. And you could just make a little chart, a little data table, and at five meters, you could just record that average time and do the same thing at 10 meters and the same thing at 20 meters or 15 and then 20 and so on. And now you have a whole bunch of data. And so the explanation for that kind of method would look something like this. We can use the traffic cones to measure distance by placing them a fixed distance apart, which we'll measure using a tape measure. Notice I said what we're measuring, and I said what we're measuring it with. We're measuring distance, we're measuring it with traffic cones and a tape measure. By determining the number of cones the roller skater skate past, we can determine the distance they travel. They go to the second cone, that's 10. They go to the third cone, that's 15, and so on. Three students can be stationed next to each cone and measure the time it takes for the roller, coder, roller skaters, roller coasters, roller skaters to move from their cone, starting at rest, to the bottom of the hill. And the average of their times can be used for each trial. Multiple trials can be run. Once three trials are run, from a cone, the skater will be moved farther up the hill and a new trial will begin. For each distance, there'll be multiple times averaged together from the different trials. And that could be within the trial, so you could take those three kids' times and average them and call that trial one, or you can just take all nine times, and that decision is really up to you. It doesn't really matter that much. And that, is really the ideal experiment for a few reasons. There's none of this complicated business about the velocity measurement. There is nothing complicated about the measurements that are being made. And by forcing yourself to mark different distances on the ramp, you are automatically setting yourself up to do multiple trials thereby limiting experimental uncertainty because the best way to limit experimental uncertainty is to do more trials and additionally 
we'll talk about this in a little bit. Additionally, the fact that we would have so many distances and so many times means we can plot a graph to measure our acceleration. And that's pretty nice. If you want to, you can take a second to write that down. You do not have to. But if you want to, if you really got stuck on that one and want to write down something, this would be a good one to keep in mind. Okay, so hopefully there's an important lesson for you there in experimental design. In most of the things that we'll be talking about this year, there will be more than one way for you to be able to design that experiment. But there will always be a best way. And the best way is what you want to do. Because there will be issues with all of them. That's the nature of an experiment. But we want to try to do the best experiment possible so we can get as close to the true answer as we possibly can. And this method will get as close to the true answer as we possibly can because it gives us a large number of trials and it involves us only in measuring things that are extremely straightforward to measure. All right, now if you look on the back of that sheet, there's another question. And I want you to take a look at this question. It's very similar. It says, you are asked to experimentally determine the acceleration of a skier traveling down a snow-covered hill of uniform slope as accurately as possible. Which combination of equipment and equation would be most useful for your endeavor? Now, based on what we just said, the answer here should not be that hard for you to figure out. But what I'd like you also to take a look at is why the other answers are wrong. The right answer here is very straightforward, but there is a very specific problem with all of the other answers, which makes these kind of questions not actually all that difficult to answer. Take a second to look this one over, and when you hit play, we'll talk about why the right answer is right and the wrong answer is wrong. Okay, so pretty simply, I think, based on the answer to the last question, the answer here is, is A. And that's because we can assume the implied variables here are x naught, which is 0, and v naught, which is 0. That means to measure the acceleration, we would need the final position which is just going to be the displacement, and the time. And because that one gives us a tape measure and a stopwatch, we have the equipment to measure the necessary variables. In that vein, we can go ahead and look at the other answer choices then. So for B, B says we can use the time-independent equation using photo gates and a stopwatch. Well, as we said, using photo gates to measure the velocity of an object like a skier is absurd, but at least plausibly, if we attach something to the skier that could pass through the photo gates, we could theoretically measure the velocity. The next piece of equipment is a stopwatch. And having a stopwatch is not really going to help us to measure the distance. And if we can't measure the distance, as is shown in here, the displacement x minus x naught, then we can't measure the acceleration. So b is out. c is giving us the uh, final velocity equation, v final equals v initial plus a times t. And if we solve that equation for acceleration, we would get v final minus v initial over the time. Now we could set the initial velocity to zero, meaning A is just going to be V final over time. And the radar gun could be used to measure the final velocity, but the tape measure is not going to be able to be used to find the time. So that's out. And part D, I hope everybody looked at and rejected immediately 
because that equation doesn't even have acceleration in it. And so f using that equation to find the average velocity, like it's fine, but it, it doesn't allow you in any way, shape, or form to be able to solve for the acceleration. And so that leaves the only plausible answer here as A. Okay, now before we wrap this up, let's just take a chance to look at one more question. This is what I would what I would consider an AP style experimental design question. It comes from one of the exam prep books. It's an older version of it though, but either way, I think this is a pretty good question. It says here a sprinter running the 100 meter dash is known to accelerate for the first few seconds of the race and then to run at constant speed the rest of the way. It is desired to design an experimental investigation to determine the sprinter's maximum speed, V. Which of the following procedures could correctly make that determination? So there are four methods here. And I want you to go through each one and think about what the potential problems might be with each one. Every single one of these methods will give you some way to find a velocity. But only one will give you some way to find the final velocity correctly. So pause this video here, take a couple minutes to look this over, and when you hit play, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so it says the sprinter here is running the 100 meter dash. We're trying to find the final speed. And so looking at all the answers here, we can see what potential problems there might be with each of them. I'm down here, so I'm going to start at the bottom. Choice D says measure with a stopwatch the time it takes for the sprinter to run the 100 meters. Divide, the t divide 100 meters by t squared to get average acceleration A. Then, since the sprinter starts from rest, V is given by square root of 2A times that 100 meters. There are a bunch of problems with this one. The first problem is that what they're getting at there by saying take the 100 meters and divide it by t squared is that the displacement equation when the initial velocity is zero can be solved for the acceleration as a equals two times the displacement over t squared but since they just took a hundred meters divided by t squared that's actually only half the acceleration not the whole thing so that's wrong then by saying it's the square root of two times a times the distance they are using the time independent equation and they're using it correctly because if the initial velocity is zero, it does work out that the final velocity is equal to the square root of two times a times the displacement. The problem with that is though, is it's assuming this average acceleration takes place over the whole hundred meters and the average acceleration only takes place as it says here, for the first few seconds of the race. That makes D incorrect. Choice C says measure with a stopwatch the time it takes for the sprinter to run the 100 meters and then to find V, divide 100 meters by T. So there, they're using the equation V equals D over T. But V equals D over T measures the average velocity not the final velocity. And the person is not running at the average velocity for the full 100 meters anyway. They're accelerating for the first few meters. So that's out. B says estimate that the sprinter accelerates for the first two and a half seconds. Mark on the track the location of the sprinter after two and a half seconds. And then using a measuring tape, use a measuring tape to find the distance D the sprinter would have traveled in this time. Divide D by 2.5 seconds to get V. Now again here, they're using V equals D over T, 
but they're using it for the first 2.5 seconds when the speed isn't constant. And what we're trying to find is that constant maximum speed. Again, this method is also actually a little sketchy because of this estimation that the sprinter only accelerates for the first two and a half seconds. That may actually prove to be a pretty good estimation, but it would essentially be basing your whole method on that estimation, which you'd like to avoid. And so that's out. And that means the only reasonable answer here is A. They're placing poles from uh, 90 meters and 100 meters from the race's start, so just during the last 10 meters. And they're using a stopwatch to find the time that it takes to go that distance. We already know the distance because they're 10 meters apart. And using V equals D over T is okay here because the speed is constant there. And so that's the answer. Now, it could be wrong because it is a possibility that the person is still accelerating at 90 meters. But since it says they're known to accelerate for only the first few seconds, we would assume that they're not going 90 meters just in the first few seconds, that they probably accelerated before the halfway point to their maximum speed, and then they're running at least the whole second half of the race at their constant maximum speed. So that brings us to the experiment. And unfortunately, you are not going to be able to do the experiment that we were going to do. The experiment that we usually do in class works very similar to that roller skater experiment. And so I actually want to take this description and bring the slide down here so we can talk about it again. And so as we said here in this experiment, we would have different distances placed along this track here, and we would use those different distances to measure these various times. And using this equation, we would have a good way of finding the acceleration. So we do one from this distance, one from this distance, one from this distance, and so on. In class, we had a U-channel, which is just like a pipe that's literally bent into the shape of a U, and it's like 120 centimeters long. And what we would do is we would take a marker and mark off 20 centimeters, 40, and then 60, 80, and 100 centimeters. And we'd basically do this same experiment. We'd drop a marble rolling in the U for the channel uh, down 20 centimeters. We do that experiment a bunch of times. We get an average time for 20 centimeters. Then we do it for 40. Then we do it for 60. Then we do it for 80. And then we would do it for 100 centimeters. And we'd have this big data table, very similar to this, except the distances would be 20 centimeters, 40 centimeters, 60, 80, and 100. And the whole point of this experiment is to make a graph that will allow us to find acceleration. But we have a problem. If we are going to graph position versus time, the problem that we have is that the object is accelerating. And the fact that the object is accelerating is a problem because of what we said the other day. Remember, we said the other day that when any object is accelerating, we can write a position function, position as a function of time, for that object. So let's just take the simplest example of an accelerating object where we're going to say the initial position is zero, and we're going to say the initial velocity is zero. That just means that the equation for the position is going to be x equals 1 half at squared, like we've been looking at in all of these sample experiments. And so I'm just going to make a random one on my calculator. Let's just say the acceleration will be 3 meters per second squared. So that means the term I need to multiply 
by the t squared is one half of the acceleration. If the acceleration is three, that means I'm going to need to put 1.5. So I'll put 1.5 times t squared, and that would give me a graph. The question here is, how am I going to be able to use this graph to find the acceleration? And you could say, well, let's plot it in like a better program than a bad TI calculator. Yeah, let's go ahead, because we can hit second. We get a table. And now notice we have distances and times. And so starting from zero, we can plot these nice and easy. And so here it says at a time of zero, our distance is zero. And I'll just go ahead and do this for the first six seconds. Notice how I just typed in zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. You can also do this on Google Sheets. It would make it nice and easy for you. If you are typing in something that follows a pattern, you can highlight the three cells, grab the corner. Notice that when you grab the corner, it turns into like a plus sign and just drag down. And it'll just fill the numbers in. It's only showing that pink circle because I'm using the screencasting program. And so at one second, it's one and a half meters. Two seconds, it's six meters. Then 13 and a half, then 24, then 37 and a half, and 54. Okay. Now, if you remember when we're graphing these things, I have to do X first and Y second. So I'm just going to move that over there for now. And I'm going to full screen this now that I'm, I've got those numbers. I'm done with the calculator. And I want to insert a chart. It's going to give me a nice scatter plot. And if it doesn't give you a scatter plot, you could just make it be a scatter plot. And I hope you're seeing what the problem with this graph is. The problem with this graph is it's not linear. And if the graph is not linear, then I can't find the slope. And so what I want to talk about now is how we can still use graphing techniques for graphs that are non-linear. Now, the first thing I want to say just real quick before we get into this is we should have been able to tell that this graph was non-linear before we really did anything. And we should have been able to tell that because of the data table. Notice when the time changes by set amounts, we do not see the displacement change in any consistent way. So like, let's take a doubling of the time. When the time doubles from one to two, the distance does not double from one and a half to three, or it doesn't triple from one and a half to uh, four and a half. Notice similarly, when we double the time from two to four, the distance doesn't double either. There is no set pattern. And so we should have been able to tell here that this is not a linear relationship. So let's write that down first, actually. Linear relationships. Basic note. We can tell the data is not linearly related because a doubling of the x-axis variable does not produce a consistent change like a doubling or tripling of the y-axis variable. Now, some of you might be thinking, what if the graph has a y-intercept that's not zero? If the graph has a y-intercept that's not zero, then we won't see this doubling or tripling because it'll be offset by whatever the y-intercept is, but we'll still see a consistent change. Well, that's the idea. We'll still see a consistent change. So we can add a little bit onto this note by saying if the graph's linear relationship has a y-intercept, the data is offset. So a consistent change, like a doubling in the x-axis variable, 
won't always result in exactly the same type, type of change in the y-axis variable. However, there will still be some clear discernible pattern in the data to show that there's a direct relationship between the data. Now, of course, the obvious question here is, well, why am I talking about this? Well, on the AP test, there have been questions where they show you graphs. And the graphs look like they're really close to being linear. And they say, does this graph show a linear relationship? And if you apply this rule, you would see that even though the graph looks linear, it's not. Because if you double the x-axis variable, it doesn't cause the y-axis variable to double. This is important. So take a second to write that down. And when you're done writing that down, you could hit play and we'll move on. So now we've shown here that our data is not linear. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to engage in a process called graph linearization. It sounds complicated. It's actually super simple. And we've actually already almost talked about it quite a bit. The first thing we could say here is that when a graph doesn't have a linear fit, we cannot find the slope. That's not news to anybody, though. So when a graph doesn't have a linear fit like the one we just saw because it grows exponentially, we cannot find the slope. So we have to do something else. And what we're saying here is that that something else is called graph linearization. So if we engage in a process called graph linearization, we can take our quadratic fit data and plot it in such a way that allows us to produce a linear graph. And so the idea here is that the act of plotting it another way is called graph linearization. To do this, we need to take a look at the equation. Notice that's a pattern here. The equations describe the relationships between variables. The best way to think about any of these things is by looking at the equation. Take a second to pause this and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. Now, we've already given a note pretty similar to this, if not almost this exact thing. But this is very important. When an equation is in the form of m equals delta y over delta x, you can simply plot the variables in the numerator versus the variables in the denominator, which would make the slope equal to the term on the other side of the equation. And that is true no matter what. It doesn't matter if anything is squared or square rooted or whatever. If you take the variables in the numerator and you take the variables in the denominator, and you recognize that that follows a template of the form y equals mx plus b, specifically solved for, for m, m equals delta y over delta x when the y-intercept is 0, it will produce a linear graph with a slope equal to the variable you want. So the main deal in figuring out what to graph is to solve the equation for the variable you're looking for. Take a second to pause this and write that down, and then we will apply this specifically to the problem we're talking about. OK, so as we saw, if we're talking about acceleration, then we're starting off with, a, with an equation that looks like this. And we said that the v0 is 0, so that gives us x equals 1 half at squared. And looking at this equation, we can see that delta x is directly proportional to t squared. By the way, if I haven't said this already, this symbol stands for directly proportional. And so no wonder the graph isn't going to be linear, because if x is directly proportional to t squared, or delta x is directly proportional to t squared, 
then if we plot delta x versus t, we should expect to see exponential growth. That makes sense. But if we follow the rule that we just developed here, if we solve the equation for a, and we just see what we get, 2 delta x over t squared, basically what we're saying is that the slope will be the acceleration if we plot twice the displacement on the y-axis and t squared on the x-axis. The equation always takes the form of m equals delta y over x. And if you just plot the numerator on the y-axis and you plot the denominator on the x-axis, then your slope will be equal to the acceleration. Now, of course, this idea is super crucial, as we said, but we already wrote this down, so you don't need to write this down again. But as we already said, thinking about experiments like this is really useful because the only way you could possibly produce a graph would be by varying the values of the variables on the x and y axes. And that also serves as a method for reducing experimental error. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. And actually, you know what? I'm actually physically going to go all the way back to the beginning. When we were talking about these experiments, you could do an experiment like this, where you literally just measure the final velocity by using this method. And you just measure that distance, and you use the equation, and you do a calculation, and you get one number for the acceleration with one trial. And they might give you some points for the experimental design part, but you will definitely lose the points for the minimizing experimental uncertainty part. However, if you go into the experiment thinking about a graph, and you say, well, the first thing I'm realizing when I've got this equation here is that I'm going to take the y-axis and I'm going to plot twice the distance and I'm going to take the x-axis and I'm going to plot t squared, then that sets you up for everything you need to do. Okay, I'm going to need to measure some small distances and I'm going to get some small times, and I need to measure some large distances, and I'm going to get some large times. And then when the next part of the question comes and says, hey, how are you going to analyze that data? You say, hey, I'm going to pop it in a graph, and I'm going to find the slope, although drawn accurately, and then I'm done. Thinking about the graph is always the way you should be thinking about approaching these experiments because it gives you the most straightforward and reliable way to address all the things you need to address and earn full credit on these kinds of problems. So how do we actually do that for the data we have? Well, that's where Google Sheets comes in handy. Because notice, we said here, you have to double the distance and then square all the times. Oh my god, what if we, we only had five distances here, as I said in the experiment I usually do in class. What if we had 15 distances in 15 times? Doesn't matter because we have Google Sheets. And so what I'm going to write here is x squared for our purposes. And here I'm going to write t squared. And actually, because I need to double that, I'm going to write 2 delta x squared. Can I get a symbol from here? Eh, I'll just write 2x. It's supposed to be a delta there, though. And what's nice about Google Sheets is that you can use formula. These are all my displacements. I want to double them. I have two options. I could take out my calculator. I could take all those numbers and I can multiply them by two. Or I can hit equals, click one of these values, and then multiply by two. And now I've got a formula set up. And if I just drag it, I dragged one too far, it fills in 
all those values. Same thing for the times. I can hit equals, and then I can select one of the times. And I can hit the caret for squared, and then the exponent is 2. And now I've got my variable squared. I just want to point out, notice I use this star here for multiplication. That is Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel language. You use the star for multiplication, you use the caret for exponents, and then you drag it down, and now it's squared all my times. Obviously, you know 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 squared off the top of your head, so that part wouldn't be that hard, but using these equations is, is nice. And now, notice, if we select all that data, and we hit Insert, Chart, it's probably going to give me a line again, but I can change it to a scatter plot. Now I've got a linear graph. And if I go to series and I put in the trend line, now I've got a nice linear trend line. And here's the best part. I can use the equation to label it. And the equation shows that my acceleration is the slope and that it's three. And remember, when I predetermined this, when I was using my calculator, I said, we're going to make the acceleration three so that when we use the position function, we're going to do one half AT squared. And so we'll put 1.5 because 1 1.5 is half of three. Now, obviously, it's a little easier when the answer is predetermined because you already know it. But when you don't know the answer, that's how you get it. And that's really nice. And unfortunately, while you can't do the experiment that I had planned for you to do in person, you will be able to, using the magic of the internet, use this stuff to measure the acceleration of something tomorrow. All right, guys, that's it for today. Have a good one. If you have any questions, please let me know. Our next Zoom meeting is tomorrow, and uh, I'll see you then. Take care, everybody.